Uh, my name is Brad, and I am symptom-free. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be out in the plaza area over here after the service. I'm going to be hugging and handshaking and high-fiving, just out of defiance, <laughs> right? Yes. So, just a, just a comment or two about COVID-19, uh, coronavirus. I, it, there's a lot of stuff in the news about it, and uh, it is a serious thing. At the same time, uh, the, the truth is there's no immediate health risk, or at least it's low, low, let's say that, for, uh, for us and for Arizonans. Because, yeah, the truth is there, there isn't a vaccine yet, but there are still ways that we can kind of protect ourselves and protect each other. And uh, if you were to go to the CDC website, you would get some great factual information. Here's my first recommendation. Stop watching the news. <laughs> they sell clicks and they sell advertising. They don't, they don't sell the actual unvarnished truth. They don't. So that would be a place to start. So here's some of the things that we're just trying to be prudent and careful about. We've put some hand sanitization stations around the campus. We're going to put some more up if we can ever get them. <laughs> Apparently everyone else wants them too. Um, we're careful with our staff and volunteers that if they're symptomatic of something along these lines, we just would have them stay home and uh, be careful that we're disinfecting something. It's just kind of those prudent things. But each one of us can do a few things as well. Like one of the things we're told on the CDC is wash your hands. Who thought? <laughs> like who ever like, considered that, right? For 20 seconds. Well, how long is 20 seconds? Well, it's about this length of time. Wash your hands just as long as it takes you to uh, slice some jalapeno peppers for your delicious nachos and then have the need to take your contacts out. That's about 20 seconds of solid washing. You'll want to do that. Cover your mouth and nose when you cough. Again, who would have thought of that, right? Stay home if you're sick. See your doctor if you think you've got this thing going on. Um, but, you know, you can get all kinds of great advice on the, the CDC site. It really is. It is really helpful. So we're going to do our very best to prepare here. And uh, I would say this. We would love to put a small task force of medical professionals together to kind of guide us through this. So if that's you and you want to be part of a team that just kind of guide our church family through this, would you let me know? I'd love to put you on that team. But here's the bottom line for us, okay? We, we prepare, right? But we don't trust our preparation. We trust Jesus. We prepare, but we trust Jesus. And this is, I want to say this as well. If there's any group of people on the face of the earth that set the model for fearless living in the middle of threat, it's followers of Jesus. Because they actually trust him with their lives and then there's the safest, they are in the safest possible place they could be because of Jesus. That doesn't mean you don't get sick. It just means you're safe with him. And we want to model and exhibit that as followers of Jesus. This is the place where it actually counts to be a follower of his. Okay, enough of that. Cool? All right, so we're starting a new series this weekend, and kind of the timing is really pretty appropriate. It's a, it's a series for any of us, which will be all of us, who from time to time, maybe even in this time, face discouragement and disappointment, fear, anxiety, sadness, stuff happens to us, whatever it would be. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> yep, right there. Okay? Call security, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, if you find yourself in that place, which we all do, right? We're going to look at an ancient letter that was written by one of Jesus' 12 guys. A guy by the name of Peter. You'll recognize that. If you've hung around a church setting for any length of time, you recognize that name right away. So, kind of this impetuous guy who would just speak off the top and, uh, you know, that's kind of who he was. But, you know, sometimes we write our best stuff toward the end of our life because we've been through some things and we've learned some things. And in this ancient letter called First Peter, incidentally, Peter wants to help some people in a region of uh, the Roman kingdom who are going through really, really difficult times. And the reason they're going through those times is simply because they're followers of Jesus. That's it. That's the reason for it. The Caesar felt threatened. The people around felt threatened. And so... 
they kind of took it out on these people, and they're in a really bad spot. They've lost their homes, their jobs, their businesses. Some of them have lost their mom or their dad. Like, that's how serious it is. And so Peter wants to encourage them, and he writes to them. But here's the cool thing. He doesn't just write some trite sayings. Like, you and I use sometimes, you know, we don't know exactly what to say when someone's in a bad spot, or we've had these used on us, for example. Like, I, someone says, I know what you're going through. No, you probably don't, but thank you. Uh, it could be worse. At least you haven't, and then you'll fill in the blank, whatever it would be worse. Everything happens for a reason. Really? Hmm. If you need anything, just call me. Well, it'll all work out in the end. That's another one we use. Just trust God. He's got a plan. And here's one of my favorite. You'll be better off in the long term. Really? Peter doesn't use any of those. He doesn't. You know what he does? He appeals to their faith, but not their just like they have faith. Because it really isn't how much faith you have. It's who you have your faith in. And so that's what he points to in this letter as to who Jesus is, what he's actually done for people, and what he does. And then he makes this really cool statement. That's not just going to lead to like resiliency through tough times. Peter says, I know who you are because of Jesus. You're already the resilience. That's who you are. And so you don't have to muster up resiliency. Mm -mm. It's who you are. It's going to be a wonderful series. So to start it off, I've invited a good friend of mine, Paul Wilson, to come and start us off with this series. Now, Paul uh, is a pastor to people. He uses those pastoral gifts right now across the nation, helping churches uh, find new direction and uh, encourage pastors. He's part of a group in our city called Accelerate Group. But uh, more than anything, the reason he's here is because I asked him and because I know he loves Jesus. He's been through his own difficulty through the course of life, and I think he has something to say to us from Jesus. So, to prep that, I'm going to show you a short video, and then when Paul comes up, welcome him like we do folks at Copper Hills. If you find those things that will make it worth it for you, it is done. It's a done deal. You know people, you've seen people that you can predict early on that person is going to be a diamond. You know it. How they care themselves, how they take care of business, how do they follow through, how they keep their commitments to their commitment, how they work the system, their energy level, their passion. You know it, the mark is on them. You know it. That one's going to make it. And people must see that in you. And we've all had experiences where we were working on something and we knew it was possible. We took the responsibility to make it happen. Other people couldn't see it. A lot of people didn't believe it. People were opposing you. But you kept on doing it. It was hard. It was rough. It was difficult. But to you, it was worth it. And eventually, you got to a level you know, can nothing stop me now. I'm on the move. I'm on the move. I'm on the move. I'm on the move. How many of you are feeling that right now? You're on the move. You're ready to go. You're like, bring the difficulty. Bring the problems. Bring the struggles. I'm ready for it. How many of you are ready? Amen? Amen. One or two of you. All right. Yeah. Let's be honest. Life is difficult, isn't it? Sometimes the media doesn't tell us that. Sometimes the fairy tales don't tell us that. Everything's going to work out. It's going to be okay. But the longer you live, you realize it's not a matter of if you're gonna have difficulties and troubles and struggles and, and, and overcome, have to overcome difficult situations. It's just a matter of when that's gonna happen. This theory is called the resilience and God has really made each and every one of us resilient. That's the truth. But the reality is sometimes we don't believe that. We don't believe we have the ability to make it through difficult situations. What does resilience mean? Resilience is this. It's the capacity or it's the ability to recover quickly from difficulties, struggles, trials. Again, the capacity or the ability to recover quickly from difficulties. As Brad said, we're gonna be looking at the book of 1 Peter throughout this series, and to start it off, I wanna read one particular verse from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse six. It says this, "'In all this you greatly rejoice, "'though for a little while 
you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In all this, you greatly rejoice. I don't know about you, but with the difficulties that I've been facing in my life, it's not very easy for me to rejoice. When these hard times come, I'm not, I'm not saying, thank you, Jesus, for that. Bring on some more. Bring on some more difficulty. I know that's making me stronger. I know that's helping me be more resilient. I also want you to hear what Jesus had to say about this. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I want to share briefly just a little bit of my story with you because you see, if I was up here speaking to you earlier on in my life, I really wouldn't have known that much about resiliency and being resilient. You see, the first 40 years of my life were pretty easy, pretty simple. Uh, Things came easy to me. I grew up in a church here in town. After I graduated college, I became the youth pastor there. It was my dream job. I worked at that church for 15 years as a youth pastor. I got married. I had four kids. And we moved into our dream home just down the road in a place called Cross River at 115th Avenue in Happy Valley. And life was going great. Things were going good. And I thought that was going to be the rest of my life. I thought my wife and I were going to retire in that house, continue to work at that church, and things were just going to continue to move on smoothly. But when I hit 40 years of age, I felt God was whispering in my ear, Paul, you're really comfortable right now. Maybe you're a little too comfortable. And in fact, Paul, I want you to try something a little bit different. I want you to take a risk. I want you to move out of your comfort zone. And I felt like God was saying, I want you to start a church in a different way, a church to reach people that wouldn't go to just a regular church. I want you to start this church and I want you to combine it with something and this something is gonna be a business model and the bottom line is, why don't you start a church and a restaurant together? And I'm like, God, are you serious? New church plants and new restaurants are two of the most volatile things to start and have a high failure rate and yet I felt like God was saying, I want you to reach people that have not normally been reached, that wouldn't go to a regular church. And so when I was 40 years old, I left my comfortable job, my dream job, and I took a a cut in salary of about half, and I went out and started a church with a few friends. And we were gonna start right here around the corner over at Lake Pleasant and Happy Valley in the Lowe's parking lot area. That that area had just been built, and right now there's a restaurant there called Char. Any of you been to Char before? I actually ate there last night, ironically, after this was over. But we were gonna start our church and restaurant right there in that location. And we were given some money by the church that I was a part of to get started, and we were spending some of that money. We were doing the drawings, getting everything going. And long story short, Um, the developer of that corner and that little area lost all of his funding and everything shut down. And I was like, well, what do we do now? This was this first step of difficulty that I'd had in my life at that point. And what are we gonna do? Are we gonna quit? Are we gonna throw in the towel? Are we just gonna say, this is God saying, don't do this anymore? And we decided to move quickly, do something differently. And long story short, we went over to the, the Arrowhead Mall area, took over what used to be an old sports bar, started the church there. And we used the rest of the money we had to renovate that space. And then as we were beginning the the restaurant, there was a church planning organization that said, we're going to help you out and we're going to give you $250,000 to get going. And we needed that money to start. But they were a little bit behind in their funding model. They said, go ahead and just begin. And in a couple of months, that money will come in and you'll be able to go. And so we started on faith and we were building that place out. We were ready to go. We started the church first. And then a few months later, we were ready to open the restaurant and we were waiting for that money to come in. And I remember the day when my friends came back to me and said, we've been at that meeting and the bottom line is they changed their mind. They're not gonna give you that money. <laughs> Ooh, that was a punch in the gut. And I'm like, well, what are we gonna do? <laughs> we, we need that money, that 250,000 is what we're gonna do to start the restaurant. And I remember again, God just saying, Paul, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna step up? Are you gonna trust me? Are you gonna do something about this? And for the 20 years that I had worked at that church, I had always put money into my 403B and I saved my retirement. And I just felt like God was saying, you need to, to lead by example. You need to step up. And so I remember talking to my wife and saying, honey, I feel like God's saying we need to just get rid of our savings and get rid of our uh, retirement and give it to the church and the restaurant so that this thing can happen. And she said, you're nuts. <laughs> and so did a lot of my friends. And I said, I know, I just feel like this is what God is saying. And that's what we did. And we did that. And about nine months later, we had to shut the restaurant down because we didn't have enough money. And man, it was difficult. It was tough. I was struggling. I was having a hard time being resilient, I'll be honest with you. We kept the church going. And to continue to support ourselves financially, I also started not just being the pastor of the church, but also teaching at a local Christian high school. Uh, the guy that hired me there was a, was a friend. I started working at that high school. Things were going great. I was making a little bit more money. And then a few months into that, the, the guy that hired me left and quit and went on to another place, and then things really started to change at that school. 
After two years, I ended up having to leaving that school, started working at another Christian school. During that time, we were still leading the church, but financially, we were starting to just really struggle, my wife and I and our family, and being resilient was not an easy thing, I'm being honest, for, being honest with you. That dream house that we lived in, you remember after 2008 and 9, the housing market crashed, prices went down, we lost all of the equity that we had put into that, and we got to a point where we just couldn't afford the same lifestyle that we were living. And so here I am in my mid-40s, I'm supposed to be making the most money in my life, got four kids, one dog, one wife, and we, we really couldn't, uh, we couldn't afford the lifestyle we were living anymore. So that dream house we had that we thought we were going to retire in, we ended up selling that, taking a bath on it, and uh, we moved into an apartment, a three-bedroom apartment. Six of us and one dog in a three-bedroom apartment. And it was, I'm going to be honest, it was difficult, but man, it was some of the, the best times of my life as I look back at that, as we all hung together as a family and clung to one another, and we were resilient together as a family. Shortly after that, um, I ended up having to just close down the church for a lot of reasons. I, I won't go into all those details right now, but was it a really low point in my life thinking, God, I don't understand. What is it that you want me to do? About that time, I got a call from the Christian college that I graduated from, my alma mater in Kansas, and they said, we're, we're kind of struggling right now. We need some help. A couple of people have just left the school. Any chance you'd be willing to come and help us? We can't pay you very much, but we, we would love to have you help. And uh, I felt, again, God was saying, go and help the school. Help your school. Do something about that. And at that point in my life, I, was, I took a job for the, about the lowest money I'd made since my mid-20s. And just went on faith and moved to Kansas. And uh, if you ever talk to my wife, you realize I hate Kansas. <laughs> I, I never thought I would live in Kansas again after I graduated from there. My wife's from there. She loves it. She was like so happy. We're going back to the homeland. We're going to live in Kansas. I uh, went back there. We, we bought a, a little house out by a lake in the country. Lived a different life than here in Phoenix. Worked for the school. They paid me to do one job. I did two other jobs there for free. Was working hard and thought this might be the place where God wants us to stay. This is where we'll be for a while. And after three years there, um, our finances just continued to get worse because of how much we were making. I went to the school after three years and said, you know what, I can't continue this pace. You've gotta pay me more, I've gotta do something else. And they just basically said, sorry, we can't pay you anymore. So again, we were at this difficult point where it was hard to be resilient. And an opportunity arrived to come back to Arizona and so last summer, uh, my wife and I and our, our three daughters, because my son had just graduated college and got married, we moved back here. We still have that same dog. The dog's still alive 16 years later. And uh, <laughs> we moved back here. But here's the issue. Our house in Kansas, we had to sell our house. And we put it up on the market in March of last year. And within a week, I was on a mission trip in Mexico. There was an offer on our house. And I'm like, this is it. Thank you, God. You're coming through. Our resiliency is paying off. And we were in Mexico, we were signing all the papers over the phone, getting it done. We come back from Mexico, we think the house deal is going to close, and in a couple of weeks, right before it was to close, the buyers backed out. So we had to start all over again in April. April, we found another buyer, got all the way to the close, they backed out. You see a little theme here. We're moving to Arizona no matter what in June for this new job I'm started to get my youngest daughter involved in high school here, so on and so forth. And so we had one more buyer late May. And it looked like it was going to close right before we were going to move in June to come out here. And for the third time, the buyers backed out at the last minute. We moved to Arizona. We, don't, we didn't really have a place to live. There was a family here in town that graciously let us live in their home while they were gone over the summer. And we were paying for a house in Kansas that we weren't living in for the next six months. And finally, in December, that house closed. And we had to lower the price a whole bunch, take a, a bath on our second house again just to be here. Isn't God good? Aren't you excited right now? Aren't you feeling, man, Paul, this is a great story. Thanks for sharing, man. We appreciate it because at least somebody else maybe is having some difficulty. Maybe you can re relate a little bit to my story. Maybe you can relate to what we've been through. These last 10 years have been a tough road. But all along the way, I believe that God has been there with me throughout all of it. And you know where I found strength? I found strength in the Bible. I found strength in my relationship with Jesus. And there's a particular story that I want to share with you where I've gained a lot of strength. And that's from a character in the Bible named Joseph. And the amazing thing is, this guy Joseph lived about 4,000 years ago. And believe it or not, I have found a lot of things in common with this character who lived so long ago that lived a different life, but yet faced difficulties and trials and struggles way worse, far more difficult than I've ever faced. And really quickly, I'd like to share his story with you. His story is found in the book of Genesis, chapters 37 through 50. 
So 13 chapters we're going to read through right now. Are you ready to go? No, just kidding. We're not going to go through all that. I encourage you to read some of that on your own. I'm just going to give you the highlights of this story. But Joseph um, was this guy who at first everything seemed to be going great for him. He was born into a family where he had a dad and he had a mom, but the situation was a little different back then. Back then, the dad had a couple of different wives. The dad's name was Jacob. Later, he changed his name to Israel. Today, the the country of Israel, the tribes of Israel are known for this guy, Israel or Jacob. And you see, Israel loved one of his wives a whole lot, but she was unable to have kids. And so his other wives had all these children, and there were 11 boys that were born, and Joseph was the 11th. And he was the first boy born to the wife that Jacob really loved. And so when he came into the world, Jacob just loved this son more than all of the others, and he kind of had a charmed life to begin with. And then the beginning of adversity started for Joseph. A couple of years later, his mom gave birth to the second child, a son named Benjamin, and giving birth to Benjamin, she died. And so at this point, Joseph now had to grow up without his mom and knowing this difficulty, this struggle, this trial. Maybe some of you have had to go through something like that. Well, as he continued to grow up, it was obvious that his dad loved him more than the other brothers. In fact, in Genesis chapter 37, verses three to four, it says this. Now Israel, who was also named Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So Joseph grew up with this massive sibling rivalry. His brothers knew that dad loved him more than the rest of them, treated him better, um, gave him special things that the rest of them didn't get. And so there was, there was just kind of this hatred amongst them. And it got worse. Joseph had these dreams, and the dreams said that his brothers would all bow down to him one day. And they just thought, man, you're an arrogant little sucker. I can't believe you would believe that. You're the runt of the family. And when Joseph turned 17, there was a day when all of his brothers were out working. Notice this, the brothers are working, Joseph's at home, not working, sitting there with dad, he's 17 years old. They're probably thinking, that guy gets all the favors, gets all the blessings. And dad said, I want you to go out and check on your brothers. He went out to check on them, and this was the day that it just broke for the older brothers. They said, let's do something about this guy. And believe it or not, they plotted to actually kill him. They say, let's let's kill him, let's make up a story that a wild animal devoured him and killed him. We'll put blood on his coat, take it back to dad, and he'll never know the difference. Well, cooler heads prevailed that day, and instead of killing him, they decided to just sell him into slavery. And in Genesis chapter 27, verse 28, 37, 28, it says, so when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. So Joseph is only 17 years old at this time. His mom died when he was little. His brothers all hate him. He's now sold into slavery. This could be the part of his story where he really starts to just lose it, get depressed, get angry, get frustrated, throw in the towel. God, how could this happen to me? I can't believe you would let this happen to me. But here's what happens. He gets bought up by a guy named Potiphar, who's one of the captains of the guard in in Egypt. And he continues to just do what he thinks God wants him to do. He is a model of resiliency, And it says that he's blessed. God blesses him in Potiphar's house and Potiphar puts him in charge of all of his other servants. So even in the midst of this difficult situation, he's risen above it. He's shown resilience and he's doing what God wants him to do. And then trial number two comes. Genesis 39, seven through 10 says, now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. And this was a part of the story where the world would maybe say, Joseph, if you're given an opportunity like that, man, take it. No one's gonna know. No one's gonna ever know. This can just be your little secret. Go for this. But instead, he said, you know what? I know this isn't right. This is not the right way to behave. This is the not, not the right thing to do. And so I'm gonna continue to do what I think God wants me to do. And so as a result of that, did God bless him? Did it get better? Well, here's what happened. One day, when he was alone in the house doing his job, 
the wife caught him all by, all by himself, and she said, one more time, Joseph, come to bed with me. And he knows, I gotta get out of here. It's just me and it's just her. I've gotta get out of here. He leaves quickly. She grabs his coat. He leaves and runs off without his coat, and she makes up this story. She makes up this story, and it goes like this. She says, you know what? This slave has tried to take advantage of me. He even tried to rape me. She tells the story to her husband. And in Genesis chapter 39, Verses 19 to 20, it says, when his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And so I gotta imagine at this point, Joseph is just saying, man, when am I gonna catch a break? God, I've been doing what you asked me to do. I've been faithful, I've been righteous, I've been avoiding sin, I've been trying to stay in the, the straight and narrow and, and just bad things keep happening. Joseph gets thrown into prison, and if it was you or I, and we were in prison, we would probably be depressed, we'd be angry, we'd be frustrated. And if we were writing a Hollywood story or a movie at this point, we'd probably say, this is where Joseph plots his revenge. It's in that dark prison cell when he's all alone that he says, I'm gonna get my brothers back for what they did. I'm gonna get that lady back for what she did, and someday my time's gonna come, and I'm gonna make this all right. That's probably what we would do, that's probably what the world would say to do, but once again, Joseph remained resilient. He continued to just trust God that maybe somehow this was gonna work out in the end. And it says that God continued to bless him even while he was in prison. And while he was in prison, again, he had favor and he started to oversee other people in the prison. One day it says that there were two officials in the king's court. The king in Egypt at that time was known as Pharaoh. And Pharaoh had a cupbearer and a baker that were thrown into prison for whatever reason. But while they were there, they had these dreams and no one could interpret these dreams. And Joseph said, you know what? My God has given me this ability to interpret dreams. I can't do it, but God can do it through me. And I'll help you guys. And he interpreted their dreams. And one of the dreams said that the cupbearer was gonna be set free, but the baker was gonna be killed. And sure enough, Joseph got these dreams exactly right. And so he said this to the cup, cup bearer, Genesis chapter 40, verses 14 through 15. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh, the king, and get me out of this prison. You see, I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. And man, I can really relate with Joseph's humanity right here. He's just being honest. He's like, you know what? I didn't deserve any of this. Life has just happened to me and I've been trying to do the right thing, but just bad things keep happening to me. And so this could be my break. When you get out of here, will you go talk to the king and say, this guy does not deserve to be in here. He didn't do any of this stuff and maybe I can catch a break. So sure enough, the cupbearer gets out, he goes, and the Bible says that he forgets Joseph. Chapter 40, verse 23, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. And again, difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. It says that Joseph stays in prison another two years. And I can't even imagine what that must have been like for him. But even in the midst of that difficulty, again, he stays true to his faith and his belief that God has got something bigger and better for him in his life. And eventually, the king, Pharaoh, has a couple of dreams, and the cupbearer remembers, hey, I know no one can help you with your dreams, but there was this guy back in prison a couple years ago who helped me. Maybe he can help you. Long story short, Joseph comes and interprets the dreams of the king, and the king says, since you've done this and nobody else could do this, you're out of prison now, and I want you to come help me. And his dreams were basically that the land of Egypt and all the surrounding area was going to have seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. And they said, Joseph, if you would now be in charge of how should we handle this, if you can help us with this, then you'll be the number two person in the entire country of Egypt. Jesus, or excuse me, Joseph goes from the lowest place to the highest place. Unbelievable. Genesis chapter 41, verse 39 through 40, Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all of my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. And so after years, at this point the Bible says, Joseph is in his 30s. So this took years and years for him to go through all of these difficult things, things that he didn't deserve, things that shouldn't have come his way, just life happening to him. But because he was resilient, in the end, God used him in a mighty way. 
And it says, Joseph stored up all of this grain and all the surrounding area for the seven years of abundance. And when the seven years of famine came, he not only saved the people of Egypt, but he was able to save many of the people in the entire surrounding area. And as a matter of fact, his brothers that had thrown him into slavery in the very beginning came to Egypt to buy grain from him. And this was the time when that dream that he had as a young boy came true. They bowed down to him and said, can you help us? Not even knowing that it was their brother. And this was the time when Joseph could have sought his revenge. He could have got back at his brothers for what they did to him and this whole terrible chain of events that happened in his life. But instead, he says this, Genesis chapter 45, verses four through seven. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one who sold you into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. What an amazing example of resilience. I can't believe that in the midst of all of that stuff, this guy had that maturity level at the end to go, you know what? Maybe this is what God wanted for me all along. Maybe this is why I had to go through all this difficulty was for this point. And for me at my life right now, after the 10 years that I've gone through, that's what I've been taking courage in. God, maybe this is where you want me to be. Maybe all these stops along the way has been places that you've put me to make a difference for you and for your kingdom. And so I've tried to get to a point in my life where just like Joseph, I said, wherever you have me right now, then I'm gonna try to do all that I can. There's something I want each and every one of you just to ponder and think about before I share one last story with you. And, and I believe that God is placing on each and every one of our hearts an answer to these three questions. As a result of what you've been hearing today, I believe that God has something that he wants you to feel, something that he wants you to know, and something that he wants you to do. And I'm praying in these last few moments that we're together, the Holy Spirit is gonna impress upon your heart and your mind what he wants you specifically to feel, to know, or to do. And so to close, I wanna share the story of a good friend of mine. I've asked him to come and join us today. And the reason I want my friend to share with you is because outside of this guy, Joseph, in the Bible, who's been a huge encouragement to me, here on earth, this friend of mine, Peter, is probably the most resilient person that I have ever known. And I've drawn a lot of strength and courage from just watching him as a friend over these last 10, 15 years and how he's dealt with the difficulties that life has thrown his way. So I'm gonna come down here on the bottom of the stage and I'm gonna introduce you to my friend Peter and I'm gonna let him share his story with you. Peter and I unknowingly grew up in the same neighborhood here in Phoenix when we were younger. He went to Brophy High School and I went to Moon Valley High School and we didn't really know each other when we were younger. But uh, later on in life as, as we as we be, both became adults and we both had kids, we had the opportunity for our, our children, our youngest kids, played on the same exact soccer team together. And through a series of events, Peter and I got to know each other through that. And as a result, uh, we've had an opportunity to be in a small group together. We've gone on mission trips together. We've just done life together. And I've asked Peter to take some time today and take as much time as you need, buddy. You got it? And I want you to just to share your story. Would you just begin by welcoming Peter and saying thank you for him coming to share with us? Thanks, guys. Well, as you heard Paul say, my name is Peter Nehrman, and uh, they brought me out to talk to you folks, tell you my story. I think I've had, uh, they think I've had a little bit of adversity in my life. I don't know. Actually, I'm just in this chair because I like those close parking spots out there. <laughs> don't tell anyone. I got to tell you a little bit of my backstory so we under how, understand how I got here today. Um, I grew up in Phoenix, like Paul said, couple, went to school a couple streets from where he grew up. Um, I was introduced to Catholicism when I was pretty little. Um, wasn't a big rule follower, but you know, I did what I was told. And then I ended up going to Brophy High School, and there again, um, introduced to it a little bit more, and took the classes that they asked me to take. And, when I was 15 and a half, I started working and I ended up making money, bought myself a car. So when I turned 16, I'm like, hey, I got a little bit of money, got my own car. It's good, got all the answers in life. It's a good time to leave home. So let me just tell you, if you're 16 and listening to me, and you got all those answers, you need to write them down because it turns out you forget them later on and they would come in handy right now. <laughs> so I, I strike out on my own. I uh, 
senior year comes around, I get a scholarship to ASU and uh, School of Engineering. So, of course, I don't go because I'm busy making five ninety an hour. And who needs a college education when you're making that kind of money? <laughs> so I work my way up through the kitchens and uh, end up waking up one morning and I'm working 68 hours a week and I'm feeling a little burned out. So I think I should become a bodybuilder. So I start working out three hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, I work, wake up a couple years later and I'm burned out again. And I switch over to front of the house management and I do that for a while because I think life's going to be better. And I wake up one morning and I work 60, 80 hours a week and I'm burned out again. So I decide this time I'm going to sell all my stuff. I'm going to go back to college. I'm going to earn myself a degree in nursing and I'm going to start over. So I do that. I graduate from college, start working in the CVICU. And by the way, here's a shout out to all those nurses because best job ever. You guys are way under. <laughs> You're underappreciated, but I just want you to know I love you. Um, so I'm doing that and I uh, wake up one morning and uh, you guessed it, I'm working 60 hours a week, feel a little burned out. We need a vacation. So go off to the Bahamas and why this is important is because Turns out it's September 11th and uh, can't get back in the United States. So uh, when I finally get back in the US, sorry, it's a little dry. I uh, hear about this local church and they're teaching a class on world religion. I decide uh, I should probably learn a little bit about world religions uh, due to the current climate. So I go to this class and I get in this local church and turns out Paul is the one teaching it. <laughs> So actually, that's what drew me back into Christianity. Uh, so I started going to this church, make some good friends, meet some neighbors, local group. Um, and, you know, I'm working along. Life is good. And I wake up on one morning and working 60, 80 hours a week again. And I decide we need to go on vacation again. So off to Hawaii we go. Wake up one morning, first day on vacation, and look around. It's perfect weather. Well, ocean's flat. I decide... I'm going to go out swimming, get some cardio in, go out swimming for about 20 minutes, come walking back in, water's about up to my thighs. I get hit from behind by a rogue wave. And as I fall, I hit the shore break, and my head hits the top, body hits the bottom, and that's it. it snaps my neck. I knew I was paralyzed right then, but that wasn't really my biggest problem because I was floating in the water, and I was about six inches under the surface, and I couldn't breathe, and I thought, this is terrible, I'm going to drown. Water pushes me in. I can breathe again. I'm laying on the shore. Okay, things are going my way. Next wave comes in, picks me up. Back out in the ocean. Now I'm about 18 inches under the water. And I'm like, this is not going my way. My wife at the time comes running out. And she's trying to pick me up, but I'm way bigger back then. She can't get me up. And there's a high school football team jogging along the beach, and she's screaming. They come out, pick me up. They bring me back on the shore and lay me down. Call 911 and off to the ICU I go. This is where the adventure begins. Well, they take me in and they do some surgery on my neck, throw some hardware in, put my spine back together. They can't get me off the breathing machine, so they throw in a trach. Uh, then they bring me out and uh, I can't eat, so they take me back in, throw in a peg tube. That's where they can feed you through a little machine into your stomach. So they do that. And they think, ah, oh, this is going all right. But then they find clots in my legs, probably because I'm not moving them. I don't know. So they take me back into surgery, and they throw in a filter in my vena cava, and it's made to catch the clots so they don't kill you. So then they bring me back out, and they're thinking, well, why can't this guy breathe? I mean, he can't be the broken neck or anything. So they start looking into my lungs with a bronchoscope, and they do that five, six times in a row until they pop one of my lungs. And they just stick a chest tube in, and they bring me out. And they're like, all right, well... We're done here. We're going to send him back to Phoenix and we're going to send him to a SNF unit, a skilled nursing facility. This is where they'll, he'll spend the rest of his life. And uh, at the same time this is going on, a uh, group of doctors that I was working with and some nurses and my neighbors are working to, and the local church are working to restore my house. And the doctor's doing some research and they find a rehab facility out in Colorado that specializes in my kind of injury. So they take up a collection. This is way before GoFundMe. And uh, they pay to fly me out to Colorado from Hawaii. To this day, I'm still grateful to all those people. Um, so I land in Colorado. 
excuse me, start doing some rehab and they're working on my breathing. They get the tube out. I'm like, hey, this is going the right way. So then uh, they start working on getting me to eat, but the muscles are all jacked up in my neck. So they start shocking me to get those stronger. Let me tell you, that's pretty fun. But we, <laughs> we get through that and I get to learn to eat again and, you know, I'm feeding myself and um, start doing some rehab and I don't have any hands or wrists or forearms or anything that works, but I got a bicep and a shoulder and a little bit of bicep on this hand. And about this time, uh, insurance runs out of money and who knows that happens, but it does. So back to Phoenix I go. So now I'm in Phoenix and I'm in this house and it's all changed over for me. And that doctor friend of mine, he calls me and he's like, hey, uh, why don't you uh, come out to this hospital that I'm trying to open? And I'm like, well, I can't work. And he's like, just come out here and help me out for a little bit. You know, help me write some policies and procedures or something. Looking back on it, I know he did it just to kind of get me out of my own head. But I went out there and I'm like, this is fun. I feel like I'm contributing. I'm working with my friends again. And, and I wake up one morning and I get a phone call. And it's one of my friends. And he says, hey, uh, your doctor friend, he just died in a plane crash. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. So I lost my friend, my mentor. I lost my opportunity to contribute to the medical field. And I'm like, huh. This is a bummer, so a little bit of time goes by and I wake up and I, I look around and I realize this is a new reality. I'm in this chair, my marriage is about gone, I got these three little kids to raise, got a stack of money about this big that's going down, a stack of bills that are about this big that's going up, and things are not really going my way. So that's when I hearken back to a moment of clarity that I had when I was in the ICU. See, I woke up one morning and I, I looked at the foot of my bed and there was a picture of my kids taped down there. And I said to myself, how are my kids going to tell the rest of my story? Are they going to say, you know, my daddy was a nice guy, but he got in this bad accident. Now he lives in a sniff unit back in Phoenix. We go visit him every once in a while, maybe a couple times on holidays. Um, or are they going to say, you know, he was a fighter and he fought for every bit of progress he could get. And that's when I decided that I was going to fight for everything that I get. Because if I stop fighting today... This is the best it's ever going to get. From this day forward, <laughs> it can only get worse. So uh, this is how it goes. Um, so that's when I decide, you know, I've got I've to fight for everything that I've got and that God only helps people who help themselves. And I think about my injury now, it's kind of my gift. And... Being a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to get any kind of adversity or hardship. It just means that you're going to have the tools to deal with this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, God, and I feel this is true, he, you know, kind of talked about it earlier, that God has a plan for us. Keep preaching, brother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, God has a plan for us, and it's not always on the same page that you know, my plan is on. I wasn't 39 and I woke up one morning and I said, hey God, you know what would be really cool this year if you could just like break my neck, wreck my marriage, take my money. You know, that would be pretty fun. Um, <laughs> that was not my yearly plan, I promise. Uh, but what it turns out when I was talking about earlier, this being my gift is that I got to go to every sporting event that my kids have ever been in. I've been to every school function, um, I took my kids to Mexico and built houses for the homeless. And we did that twice with Paul. Yeah. That was fun. It's not an advertisement. I'm not endorsing it, but I will tell you, <laughs> it is a good time. If you can take your family down there, one mission is pretty good. Um, I got to meet this amazing woman. I would have, I would have never met her, and she's got to be amazing because she puts up with me, and clearly this is not an easy task. <laughs> What I'm saying is some of you guys have probably had some difficulties and adversities and mine aren't any better or worse than yours. I mean, maybe you got like a hangnail this morning or <laughs> a red light on your way to church. You were late. I don't know. But what I'm saying is eventually you're going to have a time where you're going to have to choose. Are you going to step forward or are you just going to lay down this the best it's ever going to get? So you guys need to make a conscious decision of how to write the end of your story. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks for having me. Thank you guys so much for encouraging Peter. And when I started that church in that restaurant, I knew I needed a hostess with the mostess. And the first guy that I asked to be the host was uh, my man right here. And so he was at our restaurant, at our church, greeting people, loving people. This guy has never had a bad day that I have seen. That I have seen. I'm sure he has. But every time I'm around him, he, he brings joy to my life and to everybody's life that he comes in contact with. And you know what? The only way that I've been able to get through the, my difficulty that Peter can get through his difficulty is because of our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the reality. And life has thrown all of us things that we never expected would come our way. And it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be hard. Like Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the only way you're gonna truly make it through all these difficulties that are gonna come your way, sometimes big, sometimes small, is if you've got Jesus on your side. And so as we wrap this up again, I believe that God has specifically been speaking to each and every one of you. And right now, he's telling you how he wants you to either feel, what he wants you to know, or what he wants you to do. For some of you, maybe it's just realizing you need to feel loved. You need to feel cared for. You need to know that you're not alone. That yes, what you're going through is difficult, but you can make it through it with God's help. And maybe he's saying, I want you to use your story, your difficulty, your troubles to help someone else out, to make a difference in this world. Maybe those are some of the things that God's putting on your heart. I'd like to close in prayer right now and just ask you to let God speak to you. Thank you so much for listening to Peter's story, to my story, and the story of Joseph from the Bible. Join me in prayer. Dear God, I believe that you're real, and I believe that you love each and every one of us so much. And when I look at even your son, Jesus, I realize that Jesus had difficulty. He had troubles. He had bad things happen to him. But yet I realize that he responded and he chose to respond the correct way each and every time in his life. And God, I pray that you would give each and every one of us here today this resiliency to be able to make a choice to respond the way that your son, Jesus, did. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit continues right now just to give answers to each and every one of us of how you want us to, to feel, what you want us to know, and what you want us to do. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.